drinks of some sort. Okay. All right. So hello everyone. Welcome to Mentoring Mondays here at the Latin American, Latino and Caribbean Center. My name is Leilani and today we have Dr. John Tully with us. He's been at Central for a total of 20 years, which is amazing. He got his master's here at Central and got his PhD from Ohio State with a specialty in American foreign relations, the history of them. He's currently the interim associate VP for academic affairs with responsibilities in graduate studies and the Center of International Education and International Recruiting. He primarily he, his home department lo was located in the history department where he served as the social studies coordinator and as the department chair. He's been a presidential fellow and the interim VP for student affairs as well. With that being said, please take it away, Mr. Bennett. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you to, uh, to Dr. Mahoney and to all the staff of the uh, LA LLC. Uh, this is a tremendous program. I'm, I'm excited to be here, I'm glad. Uh, to be able to share uh, some thoughts that I hope you, you find helpful, uh, whether you're thinking about graduate school in the immediate future or down the road. Uh, and some of my some of the things that I want to share um, deal with both of that. But let me first start with um, a little bit of my own story. So I'm a first generation college student, and so obviously I was a first generation um, uh, master's student uh, and a first generation PhD student as well. Uh, and as I was getting my master's here at Central. Uh, as I began to take classes, I was in a period of my life where I wasn't quite sure what my next step would be, uh, what I wanted basically, even though I had done a, a multitude of things and I was uh, in my late 20s, I still didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. And so when I got here, I took a look at all the different uh, departments on campus. I was working full time in residence life and I said, it'd be silly not to take classes while I'm here. It was it was free. So uh, I remember looking down at the classes and saying, you know what, history is a class as a, I loved all my history classes when I was in high school. I was an economics major uh, as an undergrad. So I'll start taking some history classes. And I did, and as I began to take them, uh, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was very exciting and very um, uh, enriching. And I loved the whole process of trying to figure out the past and, and make sense of things and, and making arguments and uh, I began to think this is maybe something that I would want to do at a college level. Maybe this is, you know, maybe I could teach. And uh, I remember the first day I, I taught in a classroom, my advisor, uh, Professor Stan Blavis, who has since passed, uh, had to give a conference at Columbia. And he knew I was talking to him about what I was thinking about and moving on to further graduate studies. And Professor Blavis uh, said he needed someone to cover his uh, class one of the days that he was going to be at Columbia and he asked me and he called all his students by their last name and I was very nervous I was like oh I'm very nervous I don't know if I could do this and he said to me Mr. Tully if you're going to do this there has to be a first day it's like that's like it is for everything right anything you're going to do there has to be a first day and you just have to be able to jump into that to see if it's for you so I taught the class I don't know how well I did but I remember at the end saying I really enjoyed that. And so I wanted to apply for PhD programs. And I did, um, but I didn't know how to do it, right? Uh, I had nobody to turn to in my family to, to talk about it. That was completely new, completely beyond something that they would have yeah. had any idea of, of what to do. Um, and even though I had been talking a lot with Professor Blavis, who was my advisor, I didn't really talk to him about the details of how to apply. I just started applying. So I looked at programs that were ranked pretty good and, and I applied the way I did for undergrads. And in my essay, I would write things like, um, uh, you seem like you have a really good history department. Uh, I'd like to be a part of that. Well, in our discipline, at least the, uh, in history, PhD programs are not like that at all. You have to work with a specific person. You need an advisor. You need to know what your a, a general idea of the topic and the research that you're going to do. And the time period and the place. And the time period and the place, exactly. And so I'm sure these places got my application, but they had nobody to pair me with. They had no advisor to look over it. No, so I applied to, to nine different places and I went over nine. And I was crushed. Because my my professors were saying, you have a real shot. You you could do this. 
And I went back to them, not upset, but confused, right? You're telling me that, that I, could, I can get into graduate schools, and here I went 0 for 9. And I showed them some of my applications and what I did and some of my essays. And based on what happened afterwards, I can only imagine that they sat around and said, I thought you told them how to do it. No, I thought <laughs> you told them how to do it. But nobody did. And so what I want to do today is kind of give you some of that sense of, of what people should be telling you. And whether you're thinking about graduate school, as I said, kind of immediately in the next couple of years, or maybe down the road, or you have friends, these are some of the things that I think will help. Um, I took a lot of what they said. The next time around, I got into nine out of 11. And I, then I had, thank you. And then I had, then I had some choices to make. And I had some, right, some ability, and I, I decided to go to Ohio State because it was guaranteed funding for, for a period of time. Uh, and so a lot of the other ones were year to year funding. Uh, and, and I'll talk a little bit about that, the importance of, of funding as you move on. Uh, so it's with that experience of feeling out of my league, feeling incredibly disappointed, going through some real period of self-doubt, is this anything that I could do, uh, that I wanna be sure that you have some of those, uh, that you don't have that same experience and you have some tips to go forward with. So I, I think probably the most important thing if you're thinking about graduate school is to do some self-reflection about why, right? To get to that deeper why is one of the things that I, that I try to do in, in a lot of the areas that I touch. Like what is really driving you to wanna to go to graduate school? Um, is it because it's going to help with your career? You're going to make more money? Is it because you have a, a deep passion about the, the content? Is it because uh, really for kind of licensure and, and in your field, it's expected? Um, is it because your parents are saying that this is something you should do? It's because the state requires you to get a master's right. degree. Yeah, right. What might be that deeper why, um, because that you need to have, it's a process, it's an application process, it's a long process to work on a master's and certainly to work on, on, a, on a PhD or an EDD or something else. And so you need to know what your motivation is and, and be able to find that. Um, how do you do that? You do that with a lot of self-reflection, but you also have to talk with your professors. You, a lot of the things that I'm gonna talk about today involve having open and honest, conver honest conversations with, with your faculty members, with mentors, people in your department. Depending on your field, you also want to ask professionals, right? People who are in the field, why did they get their master's? Why is it important? Is it important? Is it something that you need to do right out of undergrad? Is it something that you could do after a little while? Uh, what, like, what are the requirements? And then also, what are the kind of the best practices to move ahead? Um, you also need to find out what kind of applications you're going to be, what kind of mass, what kind of masters or PhD programs, uh, how they're structured, right? So in history, especially in a lot of the humanities and social science disciplines, it's almost like a, a guild structure, right? Where you have a you have a, a a mentor, an apprenticeship, and you're working with that person, and you're learning what he or she has to offer their field of study, doing some things back and forth. Other ones are more kind of general. It's much more course based. You're dealing with a variety of different courses. You might have a capstone project that isn't a traditional MA thesis. And so it's not quite as important to match up with an individual. But there's really no way to know that, especially if you're a first generation, unless you begin to talk with professors and professionals in your field. Um, you also want to ask about reputations, right? Um, what are some of the better programs? Why are those considered some of the better programs? Is it because they place more people? Is it because they have a wider breadth of professors that you can work with? Um, one of the considerations you're gonna have to think about is while you might go in, and again, this varies widely by discipline, but you might go in with a very specific, like I really wanna look at this part of my field, but that will change more than likely. And so you wanna have enough people in that department that if you do change, you're not stuck. So you're not a semester or two semesters in and you wanna kind of change, but there's nobody there to help you with it or they don't offer those kinds of courses. So there's some advantages to, to departments that are a little bit bigger um, for that reason to go through. So you're asking the deeper why, you're asking professionals and professors, you need to start thinking about the GREs. 
uh, graduate record exams. GREs can be scary, right? They're the they're the SATs of the graduate world. Uh, they're that 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 exam that that uh, uh, that you need to be ready for, that you need to prep for in a lot of you different need to ways. Study for. You need to study for. You need to to think about the process. Um, it's a different kind of exam than you're used to. Many places aren't requiring the GRE. Central doesn't require the GRE. Um, it's optional. You can do what if you do well on the GRE, you can take it and submit the scores. But some schools require it. And so as you're thinking about narrowing that list, you need to think about that. And even if you're a sophomore or a junior, you need to begin to think about if I'm going to go on to grad school, what is the GRE? Start to get to know a little bit about it. Now, here I'm going to break off. If you're thinking about law schools, law schools have a completely different kind of process. Luckily, at Central, we have Professor Robin Smith, who's in the political science department. She is our, she has an official title with the Law School Association. She is our conduit for law schools. So if you or any of your friends or peers or classmates are thinking about law school, they need to connect with Professor Robin Smith as soon as possible. She helps with course selections here at Central, uh, the whole process. Law school is its own kind of special way, and Professor Smith can be incredibly helpful there. And the last thing kind of is so you're thinking about is finances. Uh, finances are important. You need to think about how am I going to pay for this? Um, are there programs that where I can get some funding because I'll be doing something in department in the department? Am I in the kind of field where if I get a job first, that employers are likely to help subsidize and or pay for a master's program. In a lot of STEM fields, especially, they'll look for people that like, we'll get you, we'll get you hired, we'll get you started, and then we'll begin to pay for that master's with some kind of tuition reimbursement. That's where talking with professionals and talking with advisors is, is going to be incredibly helpful. It would be a shame, right, to, to kind of go from central right into a graduate program, get hired in a firm, and then have them say, oh, yeah, one of our benefits is we have tuition remission for masters, and you're still paying all your loans for your master's program where you could have done that. So you need to kind of think about that. So, so that's kind of broad thinking about grad school. Um, where to apply? Boy, this is maybe one of the most personal decisions about graduate school. You need to think about location. You need to think about um, cost, reputation, um, your ability to get in. And one thing that maybe potential grad students don't think about, is this a place where I can feel comfortable? Is this a place where I can begin to have a community? Is this a place where there are going to be um, organizations or groups of people or things to do in this town where I'm going to feel that I can be, be have a fulfilling life. Grad school can be incredibly demanding. Can I make friends? Yeah, can I make friends, right? Is, are there things to do in this place that, that are going to be um, uh, help me lead a fuller life? Because if your whole life is graduate school, you're not going to be successful. It gets too, it gets too, there's too much pressure. There's too much time you have to spend on it. You need outside activity. Some of the best graduate students that we have um, here at Central and, and, and other places where we, where we know people are working on their PhDs, they have something else going on in their life. They're, they're helping out at a, at a, at a place like this. They're, they're involved in the community. They have a hobby. They go and, and do. They're working. They're, -time, they're working part-time, right? They're, they're doing ceramics every Wednesday night. They, they help out of the senior, right? They have something else to take your mind away from what you're doing, and that becomes important in terms of where to apply. Uh, is grad school stressful? Does anybody know? Katie is, a, is our one of our GAs. This yeah. is Katie Molinar. Yeah, yeah. It, so it, um, it takes up a lot of your time, it takes up a lot of your energy, it takes up a lot of your your emotional energy and your intellectual energy, and so you need something else at the same time. So you've been thinking about a grad school, you've thought about where to apply, you're ready to start making applications. Everybody wants to know, and you should you should consider who's going to be reading this application and what do they want to see. Um, one of the first things that they're going to decide in terms of which pile you go in are GPAs. Most graduate programs look for a GPA of 3.0 an overall GPA. 
You need to be thinking about that right on those classes. That Pretty much we got no problem here. Good. That's great. That's great. Um, maybe your friends are ones who are like, uh, right, I'm not going to work too hard in that class. I don't really like it. All of those classes they might not like that might not be major classes will count for that GPA. Um, if for some reason you're below, right? They maybe make it pretty clear on their website they want a 3.0, but it's a really a place from all of these other things that you want to go. Doesn't hurt to ask, right? Doesn't hurt to write a letter to say, yeah, my GPA is 2.95, but if you look at my content GPA in in the field that I'm in, that's a 3.7. And you know, I had this one semester that you'll see that was really bad, and here's what was going on that semester, and so. Is there a waiver? Um, okay. Almost everything can get waived. They won't always do it, but all, but they won't know unless you ask. And so that's important. And here at Central, we have conditional admits, right? Right. So right. So if someone is below a 3.0, or someone has maybe misses missing some classes, um, we'll admit you into the program with a series of conditions. You have to take one or two classes and get a B or better, or you have to take this particular class and get a grade, or you have to maintain this, this grade uh, level for, for a year, or you have to take these couple of classes that are kind of preparatory, and then we'll let you in. Um, other places do that as well. So there's always kind of ways around, and you need to think about that. As I said, some schools require the GRE. You need to get those, take those, think about those, prep for those, and take them. Um, you should be working towards some work experience in your in your fields. That's easier in some fields and more important in some fields than others. But that's something you get from talking with your professors and, and professionals, right? Are they looking for someone who's had an internship? Um, if it's a science field, are they looking for someone who's worked in a lab, not just taking lab classes, but been, a, been an intern in a lab? And if so, how do I start doing that my junior or senior year or even while I'm applying? So that I can say that that's something I know. Um, letters of reference, incredibly important. And there's some things that I found that most undergraduates don't think about with letters of reference. Uh, first of all, we love to write letters of reference. We love when we have, when you have a student, we do, we do. If think about it, no, because we have so I many, guess. so many times we have to write letters of reference, which are difficult because we don't know the student well. They haven't come to office hours. They haven't shared with what they're doing. And 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 we're faced with saying, sometimes, I don't know if I can write you a really strong letter because I don't know enough about you. That's a difficult conversation. So, doc, Dr. Tully tells me that when he was social studies coordinator, he could tell what I thought about students because I had different, like, paragraphs. I wrote separate letters for everyone. Right, but some were like enthusiastic and like this person's going to be great, and others were like, "Yeah, I'm recommending this person." Yeah. Right, and you want that? You want someone who is not only going to say that you're great, but is going to explain why. Yeah. Because grad schools often everybody they pretty much only get letters that are positive. They yeah. never get any letter that says anything negative. Mm -hmm. Um, but people don't always explain what's special about the person or where. Yeah, and all of you should like ask me for references when you're going off because I've gotten to know you pretty well. Not, um, per, you know, not necessarily like home life, but what you're capable of doing here in the center. Yeah. And so I can write pretty strong letters because yeah. you want a strong letter. That's exactly it. And don't be afraid to ask when you ask for a letter. Can do you feel comfortable writing me a strong letter? And that opens up that conversation for someone to say, I, I could write you a letter, but I don't know. Right? You don't need to. You can find, you can ask somebody else, right? But but if you've made those connections, if they begin to know you, then they can write the strong letter. Um, don't be afraid to ask for the letter to be tailored, right? So say, I, say I'm applying for graduate school and I've had classes with the three of you. And in your class, I, I, did, I did really well. It's a science-based thing. And I did really well in the labs. And, and my lab work was amazing. 
and my my kind of larger essay for you and kind of theoretical work was great. And you're not even in STEM, but you talk about how I have a breadth of 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 interest and wide interest. I wouldn't ask for, hey, can you write me a letter? Can you write me a letter? Can you write me a letter? I'd be like, Professor, um, I'd really like a strong letter from you if you if you think you can write it. Oh yeah, I'd love to. Um, remember, I, you remember the work I did in the lab, um, and if you could tailor your letter to to mention that specifically, that would be great. Remember the essay that I wrote for you, and here's the copy of the essay that you gave me, right? That you got gave me an A on that you wrote on the comments, right? Because we have a lot of things like, oh yeah, if you could mention something about this, that would be really helpful. And um, I, I know this isn't a STEM field, but if you could talk about this, we then you'll have three tailored letters rather than three letters that just say, um, hey, he's a pretty good student. He showed up in class and did okay. We'll have specific things to go through. Um, I often ask for students to provide me the essay that they're they're applying to graduate school for. Yeah. I uh, uh, because then that allows me to to highlight some of those things, right? Right. You'll see from her essay that she concentrates on this, and and boy, that is exactly right. Um, or there might be things that I might not know about you that I can also include in the letter. So don't be afraid to give me give your 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 people the uh, your resume or your CV, um, and ask, right? Like you'll notice that I've been uh, in this honor society. You might not have known that from class, but uh, but if you could mention that, that would be great. That would be very helpful. And you know, fine, I'm happy to because I've gotten to know you and I know what you can do and I can put that through. Um, your own essay, incredibly important. Follow the prompt, right? If they're asking you to write on something specific, make sure you answer that um, specifically. You want to get personal in your essay, but you don't want to overshare, right? Right. Then there's a difference there. They want to know that your letter is not the same as his letter. They want to get to know you a little bit. And if you had that bad semester, right, or or the, the right, you want to be able to say that, but you don't want to go into too much detail. You just want it, right? that was a difficult semester for me because of um, some family issues. But you'll notice, right, that from here on out, I had a three point. And if you calculate my GPA from that semester on, I had a three point nine. So I came back. They don't want to know the details of the vehicle accident. They don't want to know your medical history, but they just want to know that you can acknowledge that I had some right. Something happened and I, I bounced back and went through. Share some of your passion, right? This can't be a cookie cutter, right? This is why I want to do this. But also recognize that everybody else, so if the six of you were applying to, to our graduate program, We'd expect that all six of you would have a passion for history. That's not going to differentiate you a little bit. So acknowledge that passion. I have incredible passion for biology. Um, and here's why. I've always wanted to be a history teacher. It doesn't get you very far. Right. Yeah, because a lot of people have done that. Right. Right. I played, you know, I used to play history teacher when, you know, with my little my little friends and my little sister, my little siblings. Um, but what have you done with that passion? Right. This is the classes that I've taken. This is what I've tried to do with that um, to get through. Um, discuss your goals, right? This is what I'd want, you know, when because they want to get a sense of how, and this is kind of strange to phrase, but what kind of an alum will you be of their program, right? Are you going to be an alum that they can be like, wow, she went through our program and she was, she's amazing and now she's doing these wonderful things. Somebody that they can point to. Um, what are your goals moving forward? I think forward? one of the things you used to notice is that I would often, I often end my letters of recommendation for our teaching program or graduate school. Um, I, you know, I recommend that you accept this person. You'll be glad that you did. Yeah. You know, the university will be glad that you did. They have a bright future in front of them. Yeah. yeah. And also, You'll want to somehow in your essay mention what you'll bring to the program because they're also assembling a class, right? They're 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 pulling together and we're gonna, you know, they might have, depending on the field and the university, they might have 70 applicants and they're gonna pick 20. I want 20 who are gonna add some things back in. So, you know, a couple of sentences, maybe not a whole paragraph of like, you know. What I'll bring to the program is um, this experience that I've had working 
um, working in a center like this. Uh, and, and this is something that that I'm looking forward to bringing into the academic community as well. Right? So not only are you passionate and, and, and you've done well in classes and you have some specific goals and you know what you want to work on, and it's going to be this program is good for you. The pr you're going to be good for the program and that's going to be helpful. And then finally. On the essay part. Proofread, 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 get eyes on it, get eyes on it. You might do that for some of your papers like, oh, yeah, I always finish a day in advance and I have somebody take a look at it. This needs to be finished a month in advance, uh, six weeks in advance and then revised and back and forth and ask for feedback and take a look at it and polish it and sleep on it and bring it to the writing center. All of those things become important because everyone's going to have a three point, right? Whatever, everyone's going to come from places, but that essay is where they're going to look. All right, I'm going to finish up with some general tips. Um, see if you can visit the place. There's something about just being on the campus to get a sense of uh, what it's like. Visit the department. Ask if you can go and meet with the grad coordinator or the or the chair of the department to talk a little bit about it that you're thinking of applying or that you have applied, just to get a sense of it there. Um, get all of your official transcripts early. Right. So you might decide, you know, okay, oh, next week's the deadline, and you look through and you say, oh, they need. I went to. This community college and I transferred from UConn for a semester. They're going to want all of those official transcripts. I'd encourage you, even if even if you're not thinking about graduate school now, if you can scrape together 20 bucks, get two official transcripts from from different places that you've been to. Ask for it in a sealed envelope. They'll give it to you with a sealed envelope signed, stamped, right, embossed and whatever. Hang on to it. Because you might apply for a job where they want it. You might something might come up. You might decide at the last minute I'm going to apply to this program and they want official transcripts and you just go to your file, pull it out. Yeah. Maybe if you get a transcript that's only for one course taken out of different. Yeah. Okay. Because when they get your central application, your central when they get your central transcript, it'll say, um, uh, Manchester Community College, and it might might have come in as English 1XX. And then and then there's somebody in the admissions program who's responsible to say, OK, I have the central transcript. Do I have Manchester Community College? And they might then say, I don't. It's an incomplete your, application. Your transcript won't have the grades from it won't have the grade. OK, yeah, it'll just say. 1XX three credits or it, that it was yeah transferred in biology, whatever 214 um, three credits. The only grades are listed on the actual transcripts from the places. Um, you'll be applying from Central, so you might apply. Some for some you might be applying in the fall, right? For something for next academic year. Once you get your fall transcript, send them the updated one. Once you get the spring transcript, send them the updated one to go through. Um, don't just hit a deadline. Be a week early. Be a week early, wait for that email that says we got it. And then wait for that email that says, hey, your application is all complete where it's now under review. If you don't get that email, call. Don't be afraid to bug your professors. They forget. Yeah, right. And especially right, especially if the and 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 during the 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 writing of the essays, uh, if if and professors don't mind this, right? If you have a professor who minds this, then you need to rethink about whether they're writing a good letter for you. But if someone says, you know what, I need a letter of professor, can you write the letter of recommendation? It's due on the 15th of March. I usually say I, I'd love to um, send me a reminder every two weeks. Yeah, yeah, and that's fine, right? And then and because you got to me in January. And uh, right, and then on the 1st of February you go, your professor, you know, remember this is where it is. I'm applying to these schools. I got you the essay. Um, Remember the deadline is on the on the fifteenth of March. And right back up. Yep, I got it. And then I write a note and it moves up. Two weeks later, right? It's coming up. It's you're not bothering them. You're helping them because you don't want them to get to the fourteenth of March, and then be right on the way out the door and go. Oh, my God. And then they have to hurry it. Be fast. Yeah. 
right? We, you want to be able to get that letter done a couple of weeks in advance, and that does it, and that's fine to do. Call to confirm, and don't be afraid to ask questions of the uh, the admissions office of wherever you're applying. Right? Did you get it? Anything else do you need? Um, when can I expect to hear? What's the next process? Uh, sometimes it's it's good to talk to the professors who might be looking at. It. Other times it's not. That's the culture of your field and your discipline, and you get that from your professors, whether that's acceptable or not acceptable, kind of in your field. Um, those kind of norms are something that uh, that it's important to know, but you have to ask about it. Um, and finally, um, I just want to talk about um, accelerated programs that we have here at Central. Uh, I'm finding as a, in this new role that a lot of people don't know about our Accelerate Central programs, which, which allow you to, while you're an undergrad, begin to take some of our graduate classes in typically in your senior year. And those graduate classes can double count. They'll double count for your undergraduate major and they'll count for your graduate degree at the same time. There are incredible advantages about these Accelerate programs. Yeah, this is what Maddie's doing. Right, yeah. incredible advantages. You're paying for the graduate school classes at the undergraduate rate, first of all, in terms of finances. The same financial aid package that you have as an undergrad, whatever that is, that will pay for those courses because they're being counted on your undergraduate transcript. So um, it's, it's more difficult to finance, if you're financing on your own, it's more difficult to finance graduate classes. Um, financial aid doesn't work the same way. They're more expensive classes than undergrads. This allows you Health to- Health grants don't count. Help, right, there's a lot of things that don't transfer over. This allows you to be done more quickly at a, at a cheaper rate. Um, and we're in the process right now. Unfortunately, all of our Accelerate pro Central programs are tied in. The information about it is on our website, tied into the individual departments. We're, we're changing that. This is the this is the sheet that I'm working on to create a new Accelerate Central program where we have it all set. But we have them in criminology, psych, English, accounting, business, finance, management, marketing. The School of Business has really gone in, in, into this uh, a lot. Exercise science, mechanical engineering, and biomolecular um, uh, biomolecular and uh, biomolecular, biomolecular sciences um, (BMS). Uh, so we have. So she's not here today, but yeah. one of our GAs, um, Madeline Rodriguez, is mm -hmm. in the first cohort of psychology. That's wonderful. Um, accelerates. Yeah, she's doing yeah. a great job. Yeah, that's wonderful because, as I said, it has all of those advantages. And what we're thinking about doing moving forward is creating um, some kind of direct entry or conditional admit so that even before you apply to Accelerate Central, we can provide a conditional admit for you for the Accelerate Central program, provided you meet the GPA requirements, the letters, and everything else. The other thing that we've done just this semester is streamline the process. So it used to be, if she's in that original cohort, what she had to do was make a formal application to the graduate school, pay a graduate application fee. It had to go through a whole bunch. There were a whole lot of, of hurdles for the student and a lot of back end things for us to flip somebody over from being an undergrad. And it was real, the registrar's office was really complicated. Right. That's all been changed. Now it's a simple change of degree form. You meet with the faculty member, you meet with the department chair, you meet with the grad coordinator. They sign a form that says, you sign a form that says, I want to be an accelerator central. If they accept you, the department chair and the graduate studies coordinator sign it. That goes to the registrar. We take care of everything on the back end. You don't have to make an application. You don't have to get letters of uh, recommendation. You don't have to pay a fee. None of that. Because it's basically the faculty in that department that are saying, yes, right? You're a junior now. You have the GPA. We'd love to have you as part of our master's program. Uh, we're signing the paper and sending it out. Somebody who's already, a, could someone who's already a senior apply? They could. It would be. It would be, there's, you'd have to take a look, depending on the individual circumstances, what the advantages are. So if you would still have, so say you say you're a. a you still have classes in the major? If you, have, if you still have classes in the major, um, you would have to try to figure out. So if I apply now in the fall 
and I'm gonna I'm, I'm on schedule to graduate in the spring. What classes do I have left? What classes in the accelerate program can count for those? Um, and then we could do the application process quickly to get that taken care of. And then you'd register for those some of those graduate classes that would count for undergrad. It would de depend on whether classes were being offered in the spring That's in the graduate program that would also fit what you would need in your undergraduate program. Yeah, but it's possible. It's possible. We're encouraging students to think about it their junior year because then you can begin to take those classes both semesters of your senior year and plan it out depending on what's offered at the graduate level. What about people in education programs? Is there anything on the in the planning for them? Uh, we down the road, we want to try to, ex to expand Accelerate Central as much as possible. We'd like ideally to have every department that offers a graduate program offer some basis of Accelerate Central. The department could decide how many classes they would count, right? Some some departments are saying, hey, we'd count four, five, six. Some are saying we'll count two or three. Um, uh, some are saying we'll count two or three, but they have to be these two or three. Um, others are saying we'll count four or five and you can take what you want, because if we feel that you're capable at this point, then we'll begin to. Right, then then, then you're capable. And it's like as if you were coming in when you became a grad student, a full time grad student, would yeah. you have to do it full time? No, you could be part. You could be a part time grad student, so you could decide I want to go into Accelerate Central. I'm going to take two or three classes my senior year. They're, they're going to count for junior uh, for undergrad and for grad. And then I'm going to look for a job and I'm going to take one class. But those three are still sticking with you to go through. So it doesn't have to be. It's not like a typical 3.2 where it's like, oh, I go three years as an undergrad and then I have to go two for years full time and then I'm done. You could take those courses and then decide I'm going to spend a semester um, full time and then I'm going to get a job or I'm going to write, I'm going to do something else and go part time moving forward. It's, we want to make it as incredibly flexible as possible um, so that it meets your needs and meets the needs of meets the requirements of the department. It's really a great program and not enough of our students know about it. So part of my job is to make sure that, that I get that out. That one for nursing. There's not one for nursing. Or thinking about one for nurse. Um, and I always get confused with nursing because I'm fairly new in this and there's we have a lot of graduate programs, but I always get confused between registered nurse and certified, right? Right, all the different levels of nursing. But it would basically be yeah, yeah. Uh BSN. So it would be it would be the undergraduate and then whatever that first level of masters for nursing would be. And I can't remember that off the top. MSN probably because a BSN yeah. a nurse with a um with a, a bachelor's degree. Yeah. And an RN does not have a bachelor's degree. Yeah, so it would so it wouldn't be that. It would be BSN and whatever the next that first level master's degree. Yeah. Questions, anybody? Comments? Yeah. What do you think? I have one more question. Sure, you have the same to grad school. Uh, That's fine. Does Central have um, programs for in, in regards to those things do the training like the EMS, the EMT thing, um, training like that? The Central offers programs similar to that. I don't believe so. Don't believe so. We do have other, you know, the other aspect of graduate programs that, that a lot of people don't realize is we have many certificate programs. The certificate programs are, they're typically about four graduate courses and you get an official certificate. Some of these official certificates are are kind of recognized by the discipline as something that would bring you on to, to something. Um, so there's a lot in business, um, especially in kind of financial and accounting. Like I think we have a certificate in um, forensic accounting or something. So if you're an accountant, and then you just want to you don't want to get a full master's, but you want to be able to, to do the, to do that kind of work. You could get a certificate. Um, we're working on a certificate in um, detectives. We have. Oh, oh, that's yeah, funny. Sorry, yeah, that's investigate how people are. It's what it says fall in the forensic accounting. Yes, yeah. it's, fall in the it's, it's yeah. where you pick up somebody's books and figure out what they did with the money. Yeah, where the money went to in the right places. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. So like a tax case or something is under for tax fraud right. or something. So, yeah. so like when I get anxious because we get emails from the P card people or the foundation <laughs> uh -huh. or the CRO and they're like, what did you do? And why did you buy candy? And yeah, it's, it's basically that, yeah. you know, we gave it all away at the parade. It was community engagement. I mean, it was. So, um, Mel I know Melody's thinking about grad school. Yeah. But I know Lisa's is going to have to. Um, uh, Katie is in grad school. Excellent. Um, and Melanie, I haven't heard. I haven't heard from Colin or from from Adi. But At this point, I'm not likely to do a full master's in radio certificate. Yeah, we have a variety of certificate programs that other places do as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a conversation to have with your advisor, or yeah. you can have, I mean, we can talk about it um, a little bit, but part of it kind of, to me, depends on what you'd like your life to be yeah. like. I mean, do you want to stay in Connecticut? Are you? Right? Are you kind of discipline focused? Or are you thinking about? So there's a on the one hand, there's you know masters in business administration that people think about a lot, but there's also a masters in public administration, mm -hmm. right? Which or nonprofit management, which teach you how to run nonprofits or work in the public sector, and you know it's kind of teaching you about budgets and forensic accountants and yeah. and all that. All that. It all gets into that. What I started with, or what I did after my own little story, is that deeper why. Like, what, what, how would this fit into who you want to be and what your career goal, goals are right. and your academic goals are? And that's different for everybody. And it's fine, right? For some of you, it's like, it's perfect. It's working out great. It's even, you see, you see yourself in grad school. Other people, like, maybe grad school down the road, or maybe not. I didn't think about seeing myself in grad school when I got out of college. I. Yeah. Wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Still, I'm not always sure what I want to do, right? But um, I kind of bumped into a great professor, and and so um, while I was working full time, and managed to um, take my master's degree classes um, for free when I was working at Tufts University, and. One semester I took took two classes and I swore I would never do that again mm -hmm. because I was working 40 hours a week. Yeah. yeah. I I had a job in an office like Brenda Lopez's. Some of you um know that. And I just couldn't do all the reading. And I mean it was like physically impossible. So I went down. So it took me, I think it was a um one and a half year master's, and it took me three years. Uh, because I was doing it very, very, yeah. I was doing it one class at a time, but, um, you know, there were, there were all A's except for one A minus when I got out and that really, you know, made it, I wouldn't have gotten into um, my PhD program on the basis of my undergrad degree. First of all, it was in a different subject, so. Yeah. Um, yeah. So thanks for coming, Dr. Fury. Oh, no, I enjoyed it. Great. You know. Happy to come and talk up some time about uh, international education and study abroad and yeah, so to get that going as well. Increase that. So where yeah. would you all like to see us having exchange agreements with um universities? Any ideas? Iceland. Iceland. <laughs> you want to go to you're you're always freezing, Colin. This one comes from my mother. She did a, she's spoken highly of Iceland from 